We are going to start this module with the simplest of simple machines. One I'm certain you're already familiar with by experience, if nothing else. But even if you are already familiar with the physics of these simple machines, there is a lot of unexpected, very important and overlooked connections between them and robotics, as well as other simple machines. Let's look at levers. If you've ever used a crowbar, and I mean other than in video games, <laughs> then you've used a lever and experienced its power firsthand. Levers tra transfer motion and force and always have three parts. Let's use the crowbar as the first example. It has the load end, the effort end, and the fulcrum or pivot point. There are three classes of levers and this is a class one lever. If the fulcrum is exactly in the middle, then these two distances are exactly the same and the math and mechanics are dead easy. Whatever force I put in provides the same force on the other end. Whatever distance this end travels, the other end also travels, only in the opposite direction. Now you might be wondering, um, what's the point? <laughs> Well, this particular configuration would allow you to reverse the direction of a force, but the moment we move the fulcrum away from the center, a whole pile of things happen that apply to just about everything we do in robotics. If the fulcrum is positioned so that this distance is twice that of that distance, I don't care what, what uh, units you use, be it imperial inches, millimeters, or some alien unit of measurement. All you care about is the ratio of the distance being twice as long as this distance. This gives us a ratio of 2 to 1. Now, if I move this end of the lever, whatever distance I move it, the load end will only move half as far. Let me put it another way the effort end will move two times farther than the load end will, but whatever force I apply on the effort end gets amplified. Again, the units of measurement you use are irrelevant. If I put in one kilogram weight on this end, it will lift and balance a two kilogram load on this end. Now, are you ready for this? This is going to be the number one lesson you take away from this lesson and all other lessons, and it will apply to everything we do from here on out we have actually amplified our mechanical force. We doubled it. So if we put the fulcrum here, so that this distance is 100 times longer than this one, and we put a one kilogram block on this end of the lever, we can lift a whopping 100 kilograms on the other end, but we amplified the usable force by paying for it with distance. If I move this end of the lever 100 centimeters, the load end only moves about one centimeter. But who cares? If I make a lever 101 centimeters long, not very long, and I have the business end one centimeter from the fulcrum, and I use my body weight on the effort end, let's say I weigh well, let's say I'm 100 kilograms, yeah. To keep the math simple, yeah, that's it, simple math. So we have a ratio of 100 to one. 100 centimeters on this side of the fulcrum, one centimeter on this side. That means the force on this end would be 100 to, uh, 100 to one, or 100 kilograms times 100. That would be 10,000 kilograms. I can lift an entire car off the ground. And here's the very important principle you need to catch here. You will learn to look for this principle everywhere. It's called mechanical advantage. I amplified the available force by paying for it with distance. The mechanical advantage is measured as a ratio. And once you spot that ratio, everything else becomes easy peasy. I could build a Batman winch belt pack. 
that has a tiny DC motor that while it does pack a punch for its teeny tiny size, the real secret would not be the motor, but how I used the mechanical advantage. The wheel on the shaft of the motor might turn 10,000 times and the teeny tiny wheel pulling me up on the rope only turned one time. I traded off distance traveled to amplify the teeny tiny force the motor could produce so I could lift my body weight of 100 kilograms. Yeah, so using those numbers, the motor turned 10,000 times, but the output wheel only turned once. What is the mechanical advantage? Calculate it now, inquiring minds want to know. You can pause the video if you want. So, with just those numbers, can you calculate the mechanical advantage? You sure can. And if you've got a mechanical advantage of 10,000 to one, you are right on the money. Now, you have <laughs> no idea what the wizardry and mechanics are in the Batman winch, but you already can calculate the mechanical advantage by simply counting how many times the motor turns and counting how many times the output wheel turns. In fact, you can even do some quick calculations and simply divide the weight of the load, 100 kilograms, by the ratio of 10,000 to one, and calculate that the drive DC motor is actually only applying 0.01 kilograms or 10 grams of force to lift my 100 kilograms of body weight. So, by using mechanical advantage, if you have a battle robot and it's got jaws with titanium fangs and you use mechanical advantage using a teeny tiny motor you could apply incredible force to your robot's jaws, enough to crush and pierce even a metal frame, but it's a trade-off. It does this slowly. So you crush your enemy robots to death, piercing their internal batteries and electronics with your titanium teeth in a glorious shower of sparks, but slowly. So it's a slow, painful death. <laughs> So that's what you are always looking for. The question you are constantly asking, what is the mechanical advantage? If you can figure that out, the rest of the math and physics becomes a walk in the park. There's one very important principle here that even if you are familiar with simple machines, you may not have realized the direct and important application to robotics, especially with manufacturing robots. You need precision. Most industrial robots sport a precision of one thousandth of an inch or hundreds of a millimeter. If we have a robot populating a circuit board with microchips, it has to line up the microchip pins within a fraction of a millimeter of the holes, or else it'll just mash the chip onto the board and bend the pins. So let's say we need, to move, uh, need our robot to move an object 0.01 millimeters. Try moving that by hand or move that distance with the DC motor in your kit. It's impossible. However, if I build a class one lever with a 1000 to one ratio and I move the effort end 10 millimeters. Uh, the load end will only move 10 millimeters divided by 1000 equals 0.01 millimeters. So you can take advantage of the mechanical advantage in a number of creative ways to maximize its use in your robotic creations. Not only is a high mechanical advantage giving you maximum force, but also maximum precision so that you can build a robot which can assemble a circuit board and precisely place parts into the small holes in the circuit board or even to put bolts into a car body or frame on an assembly line. It is not an easy task. Let's look at the other two kinds of levers and see if you can figure out the mechanical advantage. Let's take a look at a class two lever. The input force and output force travel in the same direction. The input force makes a 
larger circle than the output force. So you amplify the force applied to the load at the expense of distance traveled on the effort end. We apply a force at point A with the load at point B, but let us look at this from a different perspective. Notice that the fulcrum makes an anchor point. So the lever is actually rotating in a circle, with the fulcrum being the center point. As they rotate around the same rotation point, they make a complete circle. This outer circle from point A had the rate at twice the radius of point B. So point A's circumference, or its distance traveled, will be twice that of point B, right? Again, your unit of measure is irrelevant. If point A travels, you know, 40 Klingon parsecs, then point B will travel 20 Klingon parsecs. Or you could say point B traveled half as far as point A. Aha! Mechanical advantage. But what is the mechanical advantage then? It can be calculated by dividing the distance the input traveled by the distance the load traveled. It can be calculated by the distance between the force uh, the force and fulcrum divided by the distance of the load from the fulcrum. Or it can be calculated by the input force divided by the force applied to the load. In this case, we always come to the same conclusion. We have a mechanical advantage of two to one. All right. Last but certainly not least, the class three lever is almost like a combination of the class one and class two levers. If we move the fulcrum to the end and put the force in the middle of the lo and, and the load on the end, the load and the output force are in the same direction. However, the mechanical advantage is now radically different. Again, calculate the mechanical advantage ratio by looking at the circumference of the two circles. The ratio is simply calculated by dividing A by B. By simply measuring the distance the effort end from the fulcrum and divide that number by the distance of the load end, you get your mechanical advantage. We always calculate the mechanical advantage of effort distance divided by the load distance, or effort force divided by the force on the load. That means we have a mechanical advantage of 0.5 to 1. So that means if I put in a force of 1 kilogram, the load will only experience a force of 0.5 kilograms. Well, what on earth kind of mechanical advantage is that? That's almost like a mechanical disadvantage. Why on earth would you want that? Well, let's say I've got a battle robot. Using a class two lever, you can make a carbide tipped killer death hammer spike, which then impales the metal hull of my helpless robot opponents. Its infrared eyes go dark as the spike penetrates its Arduino brain. <laughs> anyway. So the force of the air piston has been greatly reduced at the load end, but it made up for it in distance traveled. And in this case, speed. We want speed for our carbide tipped killer death hammer spike as its speed and inertia are what make it deadly. So look what happened. In this case, we had a mechanical advantage of <laughs> 0.121 to 1, or switch it around to understand it easier, 8.2 to 1. The load traveled 8.2 times as far and 8.2 times as fast as the effort. So we amplified the distance traveled and we paid for that mechanical gain by consuming more force required at the effort point of the lever. 
So other than our carbide tipped killer death hammer spike, there are several scenarios where you might see or use a lever like this. Namely, where you have lots of force available, but you need to move your load fast and far. The classic Middle Ages siege weapon called the trebuchet is a classic example. They had a huge weight, which when released, lobs a very heavy projectile at incredible speed and distance. Now, I've been referring to these forces as being linear in a line, but levers don't work in a line. They are rotating around their fulcrum. So if I apply a force in a straight line, what's going to happen is the lever will simply rotate until the force is simply pulling against the fulcrum and we lose all force because the fulcrum is an anchor. It ain't moving. So while I can apply a linear force, my travel is limited because my force quickly gets transferred from performing work on the load via the lever to fruitlessly fighting the anchor of the lever. To compensate for this, I can join another lever in tandem with the first And once my effort force has turned the lever so far, I can switch to applying the effort force to the next lever. In fact, I can add an entire rotation of levers. All joined together using the same fulcrum, but look what I've now made. I have effectively made a gear. We'll explore the principles of gears and mechanical advantage in the next few lessons. We'll use our physics kit with the spring scales and the lever bar. Set up several different scenarios of mechanical advantage for all three classes of lever by changing the fulcrum points and where you hook in the spring scales. Make predictions based on the mechanical advantage of the current setup and then conduct experiments measuring the input force with one spring scale, the output force with the other spring scale, and measure the distance traveled for input and output using the rulers engraved on the physics table. See if it approximately matches your predictions. From there, you can move on to other challenges using simple materials like cardboard or paper. Build a trebuchet. Calculate the mechanical advantage of the simple machine and see if you can get some wads of paper into the garbage can from across the room.